This second program in the series on hot mix asphalt paving inspection will continue on the preparations for paving. We'll look at setting up traffic controls, preparing different types of existing surfaces, such as cold milling, scratch course, and concrete overlay, raising drainage structures, setting alignment and grade, making butt joints, observing weather and seasonal limitations, and applying bond coats. To begin, traffic control is an important concern, not only for asphalt paving construction, but also during it. Your responsibility includes becoming familiar with the guidelines in the Michigan Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and with the Special Provision Section 812 of the Proposal for Maintaining Traffic. You should know what signs and devices are required, as well as their sequences and spacings through all phases of the project. Before work begins, make sure that the contractor has an adequate supply of the proper items. Be sure they're set up correctly. Signs, arrow panels, channelizing devices, traffic regulating personnel, and so on. And maintained that way at all times during the project. Keep in mind that the purpose of traffic controlling is to allow vehicles and pedestrians to move safely through the work zone and to protect workers and inspection personnel from mishap. It's also important that driveway connections be maintained and that access is provided at all times to homes, businesses, and other properties. Hot mix asphalt pavements are constructed on a variety of surfaces. Aggregate, HMA or concrete based courses, HMA pavements, or Portland cement concrete pavements. Whatever the existing surface is made of must meet the grade cross section and density requirements specified in the contract document. And it must be clean, dry, and in good condition, free of defects of any kind. For aggregate surfaces, that means no holes, soft or loose spots, or ruts. Surfaces that have become wet or too dry must be reworked to provide the required density. Of course, the preparation of subgrades and the construction of aggregate subbases and base courses is the responsibility of the grading inspector. You should receive from him a completed and approved permit to place form, signifying that the base has been constructed to the proper shape, grade, moisture content, and density. Your job as a hot mix asphalt paving inspector is to check the conditions of the base just prior to paving, especially make sure that the surface is smooth and not rutted and that it has the proper density as required by the specifications. For existing HMA and concrete surfaces, a variety of repairs, adjustments, and other preparations may be necessary depending on the type of surface and its particular condition. Sometimes the existing concrete pavement is to be overlaid when sections of the HMA shoulder prove to be unstable. Sections of the shoulder have to be repaired by trenching out the deteriorated material and replacing it with a new hot mix asphalt shoulder mixture. The work is common to paving jobs involving widening and base repair. A close look at the existing shoulder shows extensive cracking in many areas. These sections need to be removed or marked ahead of the trenching operation. A milling machine is typically used to remove the existing material. The teeth of the machine break up the shoulder in the marked sections and push the broken pieces to the machine's conveyor. 
which are then loaded into a waiting truck. The operation moves down the shoulder, trenching the marked sections and skipping the areas to be left in place. Be sure that the deteriorated material is removed completely from the edge of the shoulder to the edge of the concrete slab, and for the full depth. The removal of the deteriorated shoulder should not disturb the underlying base. It should remain intact with no marring of its surface or loss of density. A power broom will sweep and clean off the milled surface, removing loose material and dust. The next step is to apply bond coat material along the vertical edge of the concrete pavement. Ensure that the edge of the slab receives a complete and uniform coating. A road widening machine is used to place the new hot mix asphalt shoulder material to the specified depth, width, and slope. During compaction, a steel wheeled roller will first pinch the joint between the roller and the pavement with only six inches or so of the roller wheel on the hot mat. The rest of the shoulder is then compacted in subsequent roller passes. Concrete pavement preparation often includes Detail 7 and Detailed 8 joint repairs. Let's go through the procedures for Detail 7 repairs and then note the difference between them and the Detail 8. Your first task as an inspector is to get familiar with the proposal for the job. In addition to preparing both longitudinal and transverse joints, the work will include some repairing of cracks, HMA patches, and small defective areas on the pavement surface. Typically, the inspector marks the portions of the joints and cracks to be removed as well as the bituminous patches and other defective spots. The objective is to remove old joint filler, old HMA patch material, and any deteriorated concrete. Traditionally, grinding machines and backhoes are used for the removal operations. The spray painted marks guide the operator in lining up the grinding wheel over the joints, cracks, patches, and other areas. Once the machine is in position, the grinding wheel is lowered to the pavement and the removal begins. The goal, of course, is to remove the joint and patch materials and defective pavement while leaving the sound portions of the pavement intact. But because the grinding wheel is wide and operates in a straight line, it doesn't work with surgical precision. Some good concrete is broken up too Still, that's better than failing to remove all the defective materials. Obviously, this is a powerful machine that exerts tremendous force. There's a lot of wear and tear on the operator, and even more on the grinding teeth. Frequently, they have to be replaced. Doing so is up to the contractor, but if you see the machine bucking a lot, the problem may be worn down teeth, and the contractor should be notified. If the pavement joint repair exceeds 30 inches in width, the engineer will measure each 30 inch wide segment separately, sufficient for each marked area. The rubble left in its wake is a mixture of broken up joint and patch materials and deteriorated concrete. Even though the grinder cuts a pretty wide swath and even removes a little bit of the sound pavement along with the unsound, it sometimes misses spots or otherwise fails to completely break up the materials. Here, a frost tooth mounted on a backhoe is used to get into the small crevices missed by the milling machine. 
The use of a frost tooth is another method used for joint, crack, and patch repair. Remember, the contractor needs to remove all of the undesired materials, leaving sound pavement all around the broken out pieces. On this job, as the breaking up is advanced, the rubble is shoveled into piles to make it easier for pickup. The contractor employs a two-step method for removing the broken up materials from the roadway. First, the crew uses shovels and a loader to consolidate most of the rubble that was dislodged from the joints and other openings. Then they pick it up and load it into the trucks to haul away. Second, they use a power vacuum to remove the material that's still in the openings and any other debris remaining on the pavement. Another crew member wields a pick to remove any materials missed by the grinder. Here and there, some steel reinforcing bars will be exposed and must be cut off and removed from the pavement. As the inspector, you want to see clean joints, cracks, and no holes, so inspect them to be sure that the removal is satisfactory. If you find joint or patch material still on the pavement, or loose concrete, have the contractor do some more work until you're satisfied with the results. Watch too for any steel reinforcement that may have been missed, and direct the contractor to cut and remove it. The work needs to be measured and documented, because it's easier to measure the cleaned out joints and cracks before the hot mix is placed in them. Now the cleaned out areas are ready for the next step, bond coat application. Just as for the bond coats prior to paving, you want to make sure that this bond coat consists of the right material and that it's correctly heated and applied. So inspect the bond application to see that all the repair surfaces are completely and uniformly coated, including the smaller areas. The contractor should avoid spraying the material on the surrounding pavement to the degree possible. On this operation, a smaller distributor is being used. The curing time for the bond coat is affected by air temperature and the water's evaporation from the emulsion, and it usually takes between 10 and 15 minutes to cure properly before HMA may be placed. The hot mix is brought in and deposited. Because of the different sizes of openings and the different directions in which they're oriented, the mix is deposited directly into the repair areas in some cases. And in other cases, it's placed in a pile so that a loader can help distribute it to its final position. In any case, handiwork is necessary first to distribute the mix evenly in the openings and then to loop the surface removing oversized aggregate or foreign particles, striking off excess mix, and leaving the areas ready for compaction. Deeper openings, four or more inches deep, are to be filled and compacted in two or more separate lifts. Multiple lifts are especially important in detail eight joint repairs, which we'll cover later. Next, the repair areas are compacted both to obtain the required density and to leave the surfaces flush with the surrounding pavement. Longitudinal joints should be compacted mainly in the longitudinal direction. Repairs to transverse joints and cracks should be compacted both ways, longitudinally and transversely. Make sure that all the areas are sufficiently compacted, including the small repair areas that could be overlooked. As you inspect the rolling, check the areas with a straight edge. If you detect any high spots, have the contractor correct them and compact them again, 
do the same for any low spots. You should also make sure the density is within the accepted range. Again, make sure to accurately measure and document all the work before the hot mix asphalt is placed. And that's detail seven joint repairs. The basic difference between detail sevens and detail eights is the detail eight repairs go all the way to the underlying base. So that means always a greater amount of material to remove, replace, and compact to the required density. And the hot mix asphalt material must be placed in separate lifts to a maximum of three inches thick. Otherwise, the construction steps and inspection concerns are similar. Breaking out old joint material, bituminous patches, deteriorated concrete, and exposed steel reinforcement. Removing the debris from roadway. Cleaning up the joint areas. applying bond coat uniformly on all repair surfaces and replacing and compacting the hot mix asphalt in multiple layers. A roller pattern should be established to achieve a minimum of 92% compaction of the TMD, theoretical maximum density. Repaired areas must have adequate density and the surface must conform to the adjacent pavement. Another common operation to repair existing surfaces for paving is cold milling. It is used to salvage HMA material for recycling to profile an HMA pavement, to correct crown or other problems, or to totally remove an HMA surface. Milling machines must be able to remove layers of an existing pavement without damaging the underlying course. And they have to accomplish the removal to the depth, width, grade, and cross section shown on the plans. Where material is removed below the grade specified due to poor cold milling practice, the resulting holes or depressions are backfilled and compacted by hand patching according to the specs and at the contractor's expense. Another operation related to hot mix asphalt paving is raising drainage structures and water shutoffs in existing pavements. The tops of manholes, catch basins, and water shutoffs must be adjusted so that their covers are flush or slightly below the proposed wearing course, a maximum of one quarter inch. The raising of the casting, or water valve, is done somewhat in the middle of paving operations, rather than beforehand after the leveling course is placed, but before the wearing or top course is placed. If new construction of structures is required, then the raising is part of the pay item. You have some adjustments or reconstruction of existing structures. These need to be raised to meet the wearing or top course placement. On this project, the measuring blocks are set for one and a quarter inch above leveling. The proposed wearing course thickness is one and a half inches. The height of the finished castings should be flush or slightly lower than the course being placed by a maximum of one quarter inch. So after a construction top is raised, 
You should check the position by stringlining longitudinally, 15 feet on either side of the casting. This represents the 30-foot ski, or sonar sonic, in length. Transverse stringlining should extend across the full width of the lane being paved. You also need to take into account that the finished grade of the top course should be one quarter inch above curb and gutter after rolling. After final adjustments are made, inspected and approved, concrete is placed around the structure and then finished flush or slightly below the leveling course in order to achieve a minimum of one and a half inches of the wearing course. This assures enough room for the wearing course placement around the structure casting. The final verification that the structure was properly raised will come when the top course is placed. The release agent sprayed on the structure cover should enable the HMA to scrape off easily with a shovel. After final rolling, the structure top should be flush or no more than one quarter inch below the finished surface in all directions. Setting the alignment and grade for the paving also must be resolved before paving begins. A pre-paving meeting on the job site with the contractor is recommended. Alignment control is set up by the contractor to guide the paver in a straight line or on the proper curvature. Examples include following the existing edge of the pavement or longitudinal joint, or setting and following the string line. Grade control is needed to take care of both the profile grade and the transverse slope or crown. To control the profile grade, a 30 foot or longer sonar sonic, a string line, or marked lines may be used alone or in combination. Slope or crown control may be accomplished by using string lines on both sides of the paver or by crown control set in the paver's automation. Sometimes the uniform lift is placed based upon the measured thickness of the uncompacted mixture. When a butt joint is specified, the existing surface must be cut to a depth equal to the thickness of the proposed overlay for the full width of the joint where the overlay is to begin or end. The cut has to be uniformly tapered back to the original surface over a minimum distance of 35 feet. Whether or not to proceed with hot mix asphalt paving depends a lot on the weather. As an inspector, you should know the restrictions and guidelines. The limitations are spelled out in the standard specifications. First, the surface temperature must be above 35 degrees Fahrenheit before bond coat can be applied or hot mix asphalt mixtures can be placed. HMA courses having an application rate of 120 pounds per square yards or less can be placed only when the surface temperature is above 50 degrees Fahrenheit and rising. Also when rain is threatening or the existing pavement is wet, bonding and paving should not begin. If the operations are underway, they should be stopped. Finally, you should be aware that hot mix asphalt paving can be done in the Lower Peninsula, south of M46 from May 5th to November 15th. For the rest of the Lower Peninsula north of M46, the period is from May 15th to November 1st only. And in the UP, paving can be done between June 1st and October 15th only. In addition to the operations and considerations we have just gone through, other work items are specified in the contract for preparing existing surfaces for hot mix asphalt paving. For now, the last preparation we will cover is applying bond coats. Bond coat must be applied to the prepared foundation. To each layer of HMA mixture and structures and the vertical edges of adjacent pavement before the subsequent HMA layer is placed. The bond material is an emulsion, typically SS1H. The materials may be cut with water, 
up to 50% of the undiluted amount. It is recommended not to dilute the bond coat during early spring or late fall, or for night paving operations. As for application rates, the engineer will specify a rate within one of the two ranges given in the plans or proposal. For hot mix asphalt or concrete foundations, and for all surfaces with porous textures, the coverage should be up to 0.15 gallons per square yard. Between subsequent HMA courses, and for all surfaces with glazed or smooth texture, the coverage should be 0.05 gallons per square yard. In part one, we looked at the parts of pressure distributors. Let's focus on the spray bar nozzles now. Before bond coat is applied, you should assure yourself the nozzles are all the same size and that they're cleaned and unclogged. They must always be free of dirt and be able to spray without obstruction. And they must be open uniformly to produce the same spray pattern. Also affecting the spray pattern and the uniformity of the application is the angle of the adjustment. All regular nozzles, other than end ones, should be set at 30 degrees in relation to the spray bar. End nozzles should tie set at 60 degrees. This is to produce an edge of application having the same coverage as the interior portions. Make sure that the contractor is fully prepared for bond application. For one thing, check to be sure that the bond is heated to the correct temperature. Be sure that all debris is swept from the surface and curb and that the surface is dry. And verify that all the paving equipment is at the site and ready to be used before the bond application starts. Ensure that the contractor provides overspray protection from bridges, curbs, guardrails, and other structures. Make sure the distributor operator properly overlaps the joints of succeeding passes. It's a question of careful timing. Watch for the correct and constant spray pressure and for the correct and constant distributor speed. Look at the coverage itself for a thin and uniform coat. You definitely don't want to see puddles of bond or alternating thick and thin streaks. Usually a spray pattern that looks right will look good in the actual coverage. The bond coat must be applied far enough ahead of the paving operation to allow for it to cure before placing the HMA as determined by the engineer. When necessary to accommodate traffic, the surface may be treated half width or as the engineer directs. Remember, spray bars are adjustable to spray in varying widths to fit the situation. Inspect the application for proper curing, which occurs when the material turns from a brown color to a black color and from a slippery to dry texture. The specs restrict the use of the hand spraying apparatus to those areas that are inaccessible to the spray bar application. In reality, that can be quite a few areas. Just make sure you inspect hand spray applications closely. And make sure that all structure surfaces that will be in contact with a hot mix asphalt pavement are given a thin, uniform coat of release agent. I said in part one that we'd look at sampling. Half gallons of samples of the bituminous bond should be obtained in the field and sent to the testing lab to verify all the material meets all the requirements. Use the sampling spigot on the distributor, if it's so equipped. If not, the spray wand will do. First, draw off a little bond to be sure that the sample will include only clean representative material. Then, fill the half gallon sample container and cap it securely. Wipe off the container if necessary. Be sure though, not to use fuel oil or solvent in doing so. That would affect composition of the emulsion and make the samples worthless. Then, write the pertinent identification on its side. 
then send the samples at the required frequency to the testing lab. We're at the end of part two of the hot mix asphalt paving inspection. Proper and complete preparations for HMA paving are as important as the paving itself. You can't construct good quality pavement if the foundation isn't ready or if the other advanced steps have not been taken.